Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O'Culture, where the magic is captured at 24 frames per second, and so is the ritual. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Robert Sullivan IV is in the house. Rob is here to talk about, well, about a little bit of everything. He's written four books, and we touch on them all throughout the conversation. His latest book is a horror novel called A Pact with the Devil. Of course, Rob is most well-known for traveling the fringy podcast circuit to dissect the occult symbolism in film. He's one of the very best in the game at doing that. He's written two books on the subject, Cinema Symbolism and Cinema Symbolism 2. And then we'll also touch on his first book, The Royal Arch of Enoch, The Impact of Masonic Ritual, Philosophy, and Symbolism. Rob is a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Freemason, so he's well-versed in the occult and esoteric And after 90 minutes, you will know that for sure. Of course, if you're on Patreon, you're getting all 90 minutes. And if you're not, you're just getting the first 60. So head over to patreon.com slash occulture to hear this in its entirety. I should note that the Skype connection gets a little choppy in a couple spots, but nothing too terrible. So let's roll the reel on these occult feels and take a peek through this camera obscura with Robert Sullivan IV. Enjoy. Robert Sullivan IV, thanks for being here. Thank you, Ryan, for having me on A Culture. It's my pleasure to be here, and uh, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. (laughs) No problem, man. So, you know, Rob, you have been, I think, on every podcast ever recorded, or at least all the ones, (laughs) at least all the ones I listen to regularly. But uh, it is nice to have you here. You have a depth of knowledge rivaled by few, and you have real talent for presenting what could be considered, you know, pretty dense material in an easily digestible way. You're one of the the many healthy, I think, gut bacteria of the occult and esoteric, and that was a weird way to compliment you. You know, we have a lot to cover here. In fact, we're going to attempt to cover your entire writing career, which is ambitious, but I think it can be done in about two hours. So let's start with your latest book, actually. It's a novel called A Pact with the Devil. Now, your first three books were nonfiction, and we'll get to them later, obviously, but after spending so much time in the nonfiction world, why did you want to cross over to fiction writing? It was not something that I had originally intended on doing. I I was very content writing the the Royal Arch of Enoch book, and then when that got done, I started writing the cinema book, the very first one, Cinema Symbolism, and it was in the midst of writing that. This would have been back almost five years now. This was in April 2013, I had this very lucid dream. I mean, it was incredible. It seemed to last for hours. There was dialogue. There were character names. There was an entire story presented in this dream. I remember waking up in the morning, and I really li- I liked it. I-, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was worth you know, pursuing, worth writing. So when I, when I was writing Cinema Symbolism, I started doing this on a side pro- as a side project, and I really enjoyed doing it. I really liked writing it. It was like I said, it was nothing I originally intended. Cinema Symbolism came out originally in 2014 in the summer, and I I was still doing this. I was still writing A Pact with the Devil. But then I delved into immediately uh, Cinema Symbolism 2, which was eventually released a year ago in April 2017. And it was the same same thing I was doing. I was writing two books at once, essentially. Well, I I reached a point where this this was no longer feasible, where I I couldn't do it. I'd gotten to the point where I was about 60 percent through both books. And it was just, Ryan, it was just too hard to do. It was too hard to keep track of them. It was too hard to flip flop at that point. So I remember thinking to myself, okay, well, at this point, let me just stop one and I'll put it on the back burner and just really go hard in finishing the other one. So I put Pact with the Devil on the side and I I went hard to finish Cinema Symbolism 2. Then once that came out, I I just really cracked down on uh, Pact with the Devil. And like I said, it was a story that came to me in a dream, but I, I really liked it. I thought it was an interesting story. I thought it had interesting characters and I wanted to pursue it. And I'm glad I did because I really enjoyed writing it. And I liked it so much so that I'm actually planning a sequel to it and some backstories based off of it. So that that's how it came about. Okay, so I'm torn on which direction to go here because we need to we need to summarize the, the plot synopsis of the book. But we also need to talk about what the hell kind of dreams are you having, man? Because <laughs> if... If if this if this plot came to you in a dream, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty weird weird dream, and I don't know. It seems like it'd be kind of kind of a nightmare on some level too. Yeah, it was definitely odd. It was something I had really never experienced before. When I usually sleep, I don't dream. I mean, now they say you dream when you sleep, but if that's the case, when I wake up, I don't remember anything. This one I remembered quite well. I mean, and it was very like I said, lucid. There was character names. There was plot. Now, to be honest with you, I mean, some of it I tweaked. Some of it was added to a certain extent. I mean, there was one character in the dream that I, I removed that didn't work, and I transformed that character into another character. 
and it works much more effectively in the dream. So, I mean, some of it was tweaked. There was a character name also that, that I also changed a little bit. I didn't like it in the dream. It worked much more effectively in, in the novel. But by and large, that was it. It was, and it was ultimately a two-part murder mystery. It obviously, it involved witchcraft. It involves um, a conspiracy. It involves an investigation. You know, when I, when I was writing it, I was conscious of the fact that I didn't want to make it too long. You know, I didn't want my first work of fiction to be four or 500 pages. Uh, I, I didn't want that to be the case at all. I wanted it to be somewhat digestible and, you know, a story that moved, that wasn't stagnant. Uh, but I don't think it's that. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely weird. And I, I think that there was probably a lot of things that seeped into my subconscious mind, uh, probably from writing The Royal Arch of Enoch and Cinema Symbolism. And there were clear influences upon me even, you know, after the dream occurred when I was writing it, you know, that, that, that I took into consideration when I was writing it, one of which was, I really wanted the witchcraft in it to be diabolical. Uh, I didn't want it to be, you know, women who were making love potions or cursing their neighbor's cats or, you know, burning crops or hexing the crops. I, I didn't want that. I really wanted to, it to be demonic. If you're familiar with literature on witchcraft, on historical witchcraft, the pact with the demon or the pact with the devil is a critical element. In fact, it is the critical element to be accused of witchcraft. If, if that element is missing, it's generally regarded as agrarian worship, sort of a form of neo-pagan moon agrarian worship. Uh, that comes out of a book called by Carlos Ginsburg called uh, The Night Battles. And you you also find this highlighted in a book by Jeffrey Burton Russell. about He, he wrote a book about the history of witchcraft. So I wanted that element to be completely in. And then, then there was also, I found lacking in a lot of stories about witchcraft and magic was the sexual element. You know, you know, I did, you know, I really wanted to, to make this very erotic, you know, and, and one of the real influences upon me with that was this movie. It's a silent movie. It came out in 1922. It's called Haxon, uh, Witchcraft Through the Ages. And believe me, for 1922, this thing is very erotic, very dark. That, that was an influence upon me. So I wanted to have that element in there. I found that a lot of recent depictions of witchcraft on film, at least some of the ones I had seen, that this was completely lacking. And then uh, another element was, and this was something we were sort of, you and I were bandying about on Facebook last night, was uh, the, the, the one movie was The Mask of the Red Death, made by Roger Corman, of course, which was loosely based on the Edgar Allan Poe novella. This was a movie, I believe, released in 1963, maybe 64, I'd have to check, starring Vincent Price and Hazel Court. And this was, this was something that was uh, an influence upon me. I like the movie very much. In fact, it's probably one of my favorite movies from that era, from the Poe, Corman, AIP, you know, Poe series. And what, what they added to, to this movie that's it's hinted at in the novella, but it's much more expressed in the movie was this whole notion of the satanic religion being the religion of the elites, you know, you know the, the Prince pa Prospero character played by Price, Hazel Court, uh, Juliana, who's sort of his female scarlet woman apprentice figure, how Satanism was very was taken very seriously. And, and was this was not paganism. This was the express conjuration of the devil or demons for powerful purposes to make pacts with, to gain wisdom, to gain knowledge. This was something that I, I was very impressed with. So I wanted to incorporate that element into the novel. I think it works very effectively. But um, yeah, it, it's a very dark novel. It's very erotic. I thought it has some sardonic humor in it. I, I, I thought that was necessary as well. I didn't want the thing to be totally joyless. And uh, there was. A Pact with the Devil was released in, in December of last year. And like I said, I'm pleased with the way it came out. And I'm actually planning a sequel to it and uh, some prequel novels as well. Definitely, man. Yeah, <laughs> there is some horror in there. There are sizable doses of erotica. I think I had to dab the sweat from my brow a couple of times because I was getting a bit too into it. If you don't mind, too, give the audience a bit of the plot synopsis. You know, like, don't spoil anything, obviously, but what are the actual threads that are running through here? Right. Well, it starts off at Oxford. It opens at Oxford University, which was my old stomping ground. And it, it has to do with this one woman named Elizabeth Burnblack, who is drawn into a satanic witchcraft coven through her friends. And one of the friends is a woman named Melissa Parker, whose family is comes from a long line of witches and black magic. And they wind up conjuring quite by happenstance, a high ranking demon called Lucifuge Rofacal. And it is revealed that they, they, they make a pact with this devil, this demon, in return for essentially earthly gain. And, and it, it, is, it is nebulous as to what the demon's motivations are, if there even are any. 
Um, this is something I'm going to explore more in the sequel. But they, they, they do carry out their end of the bargain and they are rewarded. And th- there is a bit of a backlash against them. You know, so, some witches in their coven, uh, they're, they're in a coven, but they're in part of a greater coven called the Sisterhood of the Black Flame, which is revealed as this very old, ancient witchcraft uh, coven in, in England. Um, and there's a bit of a backlash. Are they becoming too powerful? Are they, are they becoming too well known? Um, there's too much light being shined on them. And ultimately, th- th- it is revealed also that one of the women is uh, this Elizabeth Burnblatt character, quite by happenstance, one of her co-workers, her boss is a Freemason, and, and he, he begins to realize what she's up to. Um, and it is revealed that the Freemasons, and more succinctly, this darker side of Freemason called the Illuminati, is at war with this coven. And, and there is a whole interplay going on in, in, you know, between the Freemasons, the Illuminati, and the Black Flame. There are some other elements that, you know, that come about through this. Um, there's the introduction of a character named Ryan Lowry, who seems to know what they are up to. At any rate, one of the witches in the coven is murdered quite mysteriously. And then the, the, the storyline shifts as to what happened to her. And is she really a witch? Was she really involved in the Black Flame? Is this actually real? Is the Illuminati out to get her? You know, what happened? Why was she killed? So the first half is sort of this, you know, story about this witchcraft coven making this pact with the devil, what they have to do, what's going on. There's some, like you said, erotic elements to it. And then the second half of the novel is this, you know, unfolding murder mystery between a Freemason and a Muslim who are trying to get to the bottom of what happened to this one witch. And and that's the story. That was the story that was dreamt. Uh, I didn't want to leave a cliffhanger ending. When you read the novel, you will get an ending to it. You will know what happened to her. You will know specifically, you know, what, what caused her death, what caused her murder. I didn't want that to be open ended. Um, I wanted to end that. You know, I wanted you know, I didn't want like a cliffhanger ending where you have to wait for another novel to discover that 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 is completely resolved by the end. And the last two chapters of the, the novel really set up the, the next story in it. And there, there, there were some characters in it that, that I really I really came to like. There's one character who is sort of a gossip columnist. She has ulterior motives. I don't want to give too much, much away. There, there is, you know, a, a dwarf in it um, who, who is, is very mysterious as well, who's a murderer. And there is another witch in it who's an American witch named Belinda Tain, who I really liked writing. And I kind of call her my wrecking ball where she kind of um, she she kind of uh, the witch she kind of like almost frustrates frustrates and sort of interrupts what these witches are about. She kind of is like a more evil version of them uh, in a way, and uh, I liked her very much. And um, I really liked the way the story came out. I thought it was very followable. You know, it was very easy to read and and um, was easy to follow. And uh, that was the story. I don't want to give too much away, but that's it in a nutshell, I suppose. Definitely. And I guess going back to how you actually started the book, you, you wrote this uh, this author's admonition, which I found to be quite intriguing. You said that during the course of writing your books, you discovered that black magic is still practiced in Baltimore, where you live. What, if anything, can you tell us about that discovery specifically? Right. Well, I mean, the one thing I can tell you is when you're involved in secret societies and things like that, you, you will discover, I don't want to name names here, I don't want to open myself up to a lawsuit, but you will you will discover that this stuff is is going on um, is being practiced today. There are witchcraft covens um, that are operating in major cities. They take this very seriously. There are secret societies who practice what you would call like a darker side of sex magic, like the OTO. These are operating in major cities today, and and you, you will really find out that th- this is quite real. I and mean, these people take this stuff very seriously. This is an operating network within the United States. I don't want to sound too much like a conspiracy theorist or put people in panic or anything like that. These people pretty much stated themselves. They, they, you know, really don't bother you or anything like that, you know, unless you start bothering them. But th- there are there are black magicians. There are occultists. Some are more open about it than others. Some become more open about it once you get to know, know them. Some wear dro- jewelry, um, identifying um, themselves uh, as left hand path magicians. Um, they do it very cautiously. One thing that I really discovered, you know, I mean, this is going back 20 years. I mean, you'll find, you'll find this all over the place. I mean, you'll find, I mean, you'll find it in Oxford University, uh, you know, in, in Oxford, for God's sakes, you know, is, is that um, it, it is for real and that these people take this stuff very seriously. And, uh, you know, like I said, they, 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 they won't harm you or they won't do anything. And even if you find out, you know, that these people aren't drooling, you know, Satanists or anything like that. I mean, these people are walk, talk, hold jobs, just like everybody else. But but they do operate. I mean, and they do operate today. And th- this is not, you know, neo-paganism or anything like that or, or anything like that. I mean, these people do hold themselves out as witches or warlocks. 
And, you know, they claim to be in league with dark powers. And like I said, you'll find it in, in most cities. You'll find it in, uh, you know, rural communities. And it is active. It is active to this day. And like I said, this goes back 20 years. Even when I was at Oxford University in the early 90s, you know, it was definitely going on there. You, you'd be surprised and amazed, even, even from my standpoint, about how many people over there are completely literate about people like Aleister Crowley and McGregor Mathers. And not that I would hold them out as Satanists or anything, but, you know, just the whole magical aspect of it. And Ars Galatia and, you know, the sacred mal- magic about Abramel and the Mage. I mean, th- these were terms that I really had never even heard of until I got over there. I consider myself well, well-versed in the supernatural, but I mean, these people were blowing me away with their knowledge. And, um, you know, this was really what started me on my quest in research and researching and writing about all this. But I can tell you in the audience that this is still active today. And there are many people um, who do practice this stuff. So speaking of Baltimore and I guess a general metaphysical tomfoolery, you mentioned Poe earlier. And I'm going to take us off just on a, a, a minor tangent here. But do you have any knowledge of the death of Poe? I know you weren't around when it happened, but as someone who's in Baltimore and who's apparently seen some shit there... Maybe you've uncovered some details about him or his death that aren't necessarily public knowledge? Yes, I have. I have no problem sharing this with you. Um, there, there are some rumors surrounding his death. I know for certain what happened. I mean, some people claim that he had rabies. He died in a gutter here. He was taken to a hospital in Hyder suddenly. One of the more pop pieces that's going on right now is he, he died around election uh, day. And, and there was a Baltimore uh, strong arm of the Democratic Party here in Baltimore called the Plug Uglies. Now, have you ever seen the movie Gangs of New York uh, with, uh, by Martin Scorsese with Daniel Day-Lewis and Leonardo DiCaprio? The Plug Uglies are one of the gangs. They're more affiliated with Baltimore than they are of New York. And there's, there's ample evidence to suggest that uh, Poe was shanghaied by the Plug Uglies and beat up uh, you know, and forced to forced to vote, um, you know, basically got drunk, was beat up and uh, was forced to vote by the plug uglies. Like I said, they were strong arm gang. I mean, they were literally like, you know, a gang. I mean, they had no problem beating you up using strong arm tactics. And the new theory is that he was beat up very badly by them and just left in a gutter to die. Uh, this seems to be the current line of thinking of what happened with Edgar Allan Poe. Then there is another um, theory that not a lot of people are aware of. And I, I've got this on pretty good not, uh, sources can't tell you how I know this, but this seems right to me. And I, it's not a conspiracy or anything like that. I, I've been told by numerous people who are, you know, quote unquote, in the know. Poe is buried in downtown Baltimore. At, I think it's Westminster Cemetery. I, I'd have to look. Uh, I, I believe it's on Lombard Street. Uh, not Lombard. Maybe it is Lombard. I'd have to go look it up. But he's back buried in downtown Baltimore. And he had origi- his original grave was in the back. And, and what happened was uh, he was buried back there. And the, the, the church, the church wardens tired of people coming in, tourists coming in, looking for his grave and, 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 and trampling around and, and loitering, looking for his grave. So they moved at some point in time the grave up front to where it is now, which is right at, right by the entrance where you can actually see it. If, if, if you don't even have to go inside the graveyard or inside the cemetery, you can just see it from the street, uh, essentially. It's right there by the entrance. The story I've been told is I've got this from numerous people. Poe is actually not has never been buried under either site. When Poe died, he was quite penniless. And I, I was told and informed that he is on the grounds of the graveyard, but he was basically buried in the pauper's crypts beneath the church's nave. You know, his body was basically thrown anonymously into the pauper's crypts way deep down below, you know, the catacombs of the churchyard. The grave, you know, on the ground above was just erected just for that for like tourists and sightseers. And he was never actually buried under the one that the original one, he was never there. That was just erected as like a forest monument. But the, the, the wardens and the deacons of the church just got tired of people, tourists coming in, trampling around, like I said, loitering. So they moved the monument up up front. But Poe has never been buried under either monument, is what I've been told. He is on the church grounds. He's buried anonymously in the crypts down, way deep down below, deep down in the catacombs. So he is on the grounds, but he has technically never been buried under either, quote unquote, burial site on the church grounds. I had that from good sources. I believe it to be true. Um, I have no reason to believe these people were misleading. There would be no reason to make a story like that up. So that is an interesting story regarding Poe and, and the death of Poe. We may never know for certain how he died. But the current line of thinking is, at least from what I'm hearing, is that he may have been shanghaied by the plug uglies and beaten up and died as a result. And then when he died, he was just thrown into the catacombs deep, deep beneath uh, the church there in downtown Baltimore. I believe it's Westminster Churchyard. And uh, the two monuments are just basically for tourists and sightseers that, that he was never actually buried under either one. 
Yeah, I think that is, I just have always been fascinated by the mystery of Poe's death. I mean, it's a pretty uh, apropos story, considering the guy and and what he would write about. So, you know, you mentioned uh, the gangs in New York. There are a lot of references to 9-11 throughout this novel. Some obvious ones, uh, the opening chapter takes place on 9-11, but then there are some other subtle ones throughout. I think I recall a a character, I think it was Elizabeth, the main character, you know, checking the time at one point during the book, right. and it was nine eleven, And, you know, so that event, you know, we both heard it described as an occult ritual, a black magic ritual. So were you trying to draw a parallel between nine eleven and black magic here in the book, or did you include those references for another reason? That was actually in the dream, and the character on um, the ghost there is actually was a real person. Honor Elizabeth Wanio is a real person. You can look her up. Um, and that's part of the storyline is true. She was on flight 93 and actually did die there in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Um, I never met her. She was from Baltimore. She used to hang out in a bar that I used to frequent a few years ago called the Rope Walk Tavern here in downtown Baltimore. I think that's how she slipped into my subconscious mind. I never met her, but um, I kind of liked her as the sort of salesman intermediary for the demon. Um, I, I really liked that. And I really like to have the I really like the idea of the ghost, you know, someone who died on 9-11 um, seeing the world that she never got to see, um, you know, a lot of people forget that people who perished on 9-11 never saw, you know, forget about the major things in life. These were people who never saw Twitter or watched a YouTube video or saw Facebook or anything like that. That's quite astounding when you think about it today. So that just interested me. I like the idea of having a 9-11 ghost in the story. And yeah, there, there is this very dark, I mean, it was a very hor- horrific uh, thing, 9-11. And, uh, you know, I sort of drew upon the terror of it, you know, for the book. And um, yes, there, there are some repeating, very well hidden uh, 9-11 references in it. You, you know, the, the movie actually opens, or the movie, the, the novel actually opens on the date of September 11th. And then you are correct. Elizabeth uh, looks on the clock, and I believe there is a time of 9-11 at one point. And then there's what, one, one that's much more subtle, that one of the characters in the story, I just won't give anything away. Um, there's a character in the, in the story named Sophie de La Montfort. Um, she turns up towards the end of the novel, and uh, she claims that Jack the Ripper um, was a man named Aaron Kaminsky. And this was a veiled 9-11 reference also. If you look up Aaron Kamin- Kaminsky, he was actually born on September 11th. And there, there is some hidden repetition like that in the novel, um, and that was intentionally done by me. Um, and the reason for it is I don't want to give too much away of the story. If you're familiar with the novel, um, there is... Like I said, I'm not, I'll just say this. There is a time travel element via magic in, in the story. I don't want to give too much away. But this was by, by this repetition and moving backwards and forwards. This was sort of a way for me to implant this this nebulous movement of time in your subconscious mind, which which I did intentionally. So, so you will find some very cleverly hidden if you do your research and you read the book and you begin looking up some of the characters and looking up some of the things I'm talking about, you will find some things that repeat and are hidden references throughout the novel. And this was done by me on purpose to convey this notion of of this nebulous context of the t- space con- time continuum and how it how it is ultimately somewhat manipulated in the story. But the whole nine eleven thing was used by me to convey terror and horror. I thought I thought it worked very well in the story. And like I said, a lot, Honor Elizabeth Wania was a real person. Um, you can look her up, and um, you know she was a salesperson at Discovery Channel stores. That was all real, and she did perish on flight ninety th- flight ninety three. And I just love the idea of a 9-11 ghost turning up in a novel as sort of a almost quote unquote spirit guide, you know, you know, for these women and, and sort of like this agent who interacts between the, you know, the um, the world of the afterlife, uh, the hereafter and uh, the world of today. Yeah, that opening chapter was called The Sacred Feminine. And in it, a woman named Honor dies. You find any sort of uh, irony there? Right. Well, the, the first the first half of the book is The Sacred Feminine. And that was done by me on purpose. Again, if, if you pay attention to it, the first half of the book is the sacred feminine. And that really evolves about, around the women in, involved. And then the second half of the book is called the divine masculine. And that revolves around the two men trying to solve Elizabeth's cl- crime. So that was um, intentionally done by me. And again, it's just alchemical symbolism, uh, the union of op- opposites. The first part was uh, you know, a heavy dose of the women. And the second half is a heavy dose of the men. Well, yeah, yeah. I love that alchemical play there. And I guess I was getting at, did Honor die on 9-11 just in general? Did Honor as a as a trait of our great nation die on 9-11 oh. symbolically? Oh, no, no, I didn't. I, don't, I, I didn't. You know, I didn't. It, there was no 
play on her name or anything like that. Um, that's her real name was Honor Elizabeth Wanio. No, the, the, I, did, I did not. I did not, you know, do that as any sort of uh, play on her name or anything like that. Um, that was her name. And that was what I stuck with in the novel that, that there was no double meaning intended uh, by, by me using her or anything like that. Well, yeah, I get that. But I'm just curious if you think, could we look at 9-11 as an event where Honor did die? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, well, I, I don't know about that. You know, I, I think that's I, I just looked at it more as a terror incident. You know, if, if you're familiar with the other books that I've written, I view it as more of an astrological event, uh, more than something like that, where it has to do with the end of the age of Pisces and the start of the age of Aquarius. That's sort of my more esoteric take on it. I, I don't really see it as sort of the end of, you know, chivalry or honor in the United States. I see it more as an astrological event, if anything. That is fair. So uh, you mentioned you spent some time at Oxford University, and some of the story is set in a, a well-known London cemetery called Highgate. Now, Highgate, I wouldn't call it a staple of British horror films, but it's definitely a recurring character in that genre if people are familiar with some old, you know, 60s and 70s British horror films. Was there a specific reason you used this setting? Were you trying to perhaps channel something from other stories into your book here, some occult casting of your own? Yeah, that's a great question. It was in the dream. Highgate Cemetery was in the dream. And when I was over in England, I visited it. I, I, I went there as a tourist a couple times, the Highgate Cemetery, and it left quite an impression. I was very impressed with it. Um, and you're right. I believe I, I know there's a Dracula, one of the Christopher Lee Dracula movies, I, I think, is, is centered around Highgate Cemetery. And I know the one with Vincent Price also, the abominable Dr. Fives. Uh, there's actually a scene in Highgate Cemetery where his wife is allegedly buried. And it's, it's an impressive cemetery. It's divided into two sections, a west and an east. The west section is really the older part. The, and the east section is, is old, but they call it the new part. But it's just this overgrown Victorian burial ground. And it, it just leaves quite an impression. I've never seen anything like it. And if you're ever in London, by all means, uh, and you're, you, know, you have time, by all means, see it as a tourist. It is quite something to take in. Um, it's just really impressive. They have all this old Egyptian architecture from the 19th century, you know, obelisks, pyramids. Uh, it's all over the place. I mean, all the death architecture, you know, the, the, the broken columns, the angels weeping, skulls, skeletons, it's, it's all there. And it's all overgrown. It's, it's quite impressive. And when I had the dream, it was set there. And, you know, I'm sure that that, you know, like I said, I visited it while I was living in England. And uh, I have no doubt that that didn't, you know, leave an impression with me. I just couldn't think of a better place, you know, to set a story about witchcraft and the occult than Highgate Cemetery. I mean, if you've ever been there, my goodness gracious. I mean, it just the place has a life of its own, quite literally. And, uh, you know, until, if you've ever been if you've never been there, you know, by all means, if you get a minute, take a you know, Google and look at some of the pictures. You know, it's just magnificent. You, you never really experience anything like it. I, I just loved it as a setting. I just thought it worked perfectly in the story. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I was really trying to draw. Maybe subconsciously I was trying to draw for some for some earlier horror, horror movies. You really don't need to almost. The place is quite sinister. I mean, quite foreboding, even in the daylight hours. And like I said, it definitely leaves an impression, no doubt about it. Yeah, that uh, that Christopher Lee film you, you referenced was Taste the Blood of Dracula. That mm. was uh, an, an old Hammer film. And then I think Highgate also features prominently in that original Tales from the Crypt movie uh, from the 70s, too. So I'm curious how authors use their own reality and, and sort of blend it into their fiction. What can you tell us about that in your life? What in your reality may have worked its way into your fiction here? Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. Well, one of the things that I noticed when I was writing this was, and is, is when you're, for me at any rate, one, one thing that you should do, and a person could take my advice or not, that's fine, was you want to integrate things that exist in the real world into your fiction. I mean, because it does ground it in reality. Now, of course, if you're writing a story that takes place on another planet or you know, takes place 500 years from now or something, then you're then you're in another ballpark. But if you're writing a, a work of fiction that play, takes place in today's world or in, in reality on planet Earth, whether it you know, be 10 years ago or something like that, you want to um, at least ground it in some sort of form and reality. And a good way to do this is simple, almost like product placement. Um, have the people drive cars that are actual, you know, a BMW or something like that. Have them smoke cigarettes that are real, Marlboro, um, or, uh, you know, drinks that are real, you know, Crown Royal Whiskey or Miller Lite or something like that. Set the thing in, um, like I did, in places that exist on, on planet Earth, Highgate Cemetery, uh, the Maryland Historical Society, a real place, Oxford University, a real place, Christchurch, a real place, 
uh, the King's Arms, a real place. Uh, the two bookstores, or the one bookstore, uh, Blackwell's, a real place. The, the one shop they go to, I can't remember it right now. It's escaping me. A real place. You know, Highgate Cemetery, a real place. The Ten Bells, a real place. That, that, that helps, I think, ground the story in reality and makes it much more powerful that you're conveying, you know, that this could actually be happening in the real world. Now, of course, if your story takes place in outer space or on another planet, you know, or in the 5,000 years from now on, on another planet, you're obviously in a completely other reality. But if you're having it take place on planet Earth, you know, in the times we live in, and you want it to have that, you know, it's fiction, but you want it to have it that real feel, grounded it with real things. Like, for example, I mean, just again, you know, in, in their uh, social media is men- mentioned, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And I thought, I think it works very well. You know, it, it grounds the characters. It, it conveys a sense that it's real. And I've actually had people email me who read the book and um, were saying to me, you know, I was impressed with it, saying, you know, is this real or is this fake? You know, and they had trouble distinguishing it. Um, there were some people, you know, a, a couple of people in there wanting to know if the Sisterhood of the Black Flame was real. And there was a couple of books in there um, that are real, but there was a couple that I made up. Um, and they had trouble distinguishing them. And that's a good thing. That's powerful. That's great. So a, a good way to integrate this is you want to integrate the fiction with reality. And I think it makes it much more, I think it makes the fiction much more powerful. So that that was one way I did it. And again, like with uh, the secret societies, like the Freemasons, uh, that's real. Um, certainly the Lu- Illuminati is rumored to be real, but we don't know for sure. Right? At least it used to be real. The Jesuits, obviously a real organization. The Dominicans, a real organization. So that, that to me, I thought was very powerful and I thought worked very effectively in the novel. And I thought it imbued it with a sense of reality. And I thought it was very necessary. And I really liked the way it came out. I would agree with that. I think it is necessary to to do that too. And you also mentioned some of my podcasting brethren here, Aeon Byte, Higher Side Chats. I thought that was a nice little touch too. Yeah, well, when I do the um, when I do the sequel, I'll have to throw in a culture somehow. Um, no question <laughs> well, I don't about know. it. Yeah, I don't know if we're that if we're that well known yet. But thank you. Well, yeah, well, I, I, I'm I'm friends with Miguel Connor. I've been on his show, good God, numerous times. And Higher Side Chats, great call. Well, yeah, I've been on his show a couple times as well. I remember seeing the writing, and I didn't want to do a laundry list of uh, podcasts I've been on. But I thought, well, let me just throw a bone to those guys. You know, I've I've always enjoyed their shows, and like I said, when I do the sequel, I'll try to squeeze in uh, a culture, and uh, you know, have have uh, Rob there, uh, you know, and Amir, maybe a peer as guest or something like that. Don't force it in there, man. So I'm not published fiction, but I have written some. I'm currently writing some too, and there are definitely aspects of myself in characters as is the case for all fiction writers. So where does Robert Sullivan IV find himself in this book? Right. Well, there is a character in there named Robert Sunderland, um, who is obviously loosely, and I hashtag and underline the word loosely based on me. Um, He's an author. He's a lawyer. uh, He's from Baltimore. Uh, He hangs out in one of the bars, Mother's Bar and Grill, which is real also, um, which is a bar I sometimes frequent. But um, yeah, he's, uh, he's a guy that he was sort of, I figured when I was writing this, I figured, well, let me just use some of my own attributes with this character. And it made it much more easy to write, that's for certain. And, you know, I think to a certain extent with, um, you know, with, with, with Rob and Amir and things like that, certainly that, you know, maybe, you know, interactions, you know, and you, some friendship in, in your life that you kind of base it on. I definitely drew from, you know, real life experiences. Now, I've never been in a temple. I had a demon chasing me or anything like that. But I mean, you know, the whole thing with the podcasting and the writing of the books and investigating and things like that, that's certainly all things I'm very familiar with. So yeah, the, the Rob Sunderland character, you know, if you read A Pact with the Devil, is clearly loosely based on me. I, th- I, th- I think you'll probably pick that up if you read the story. So I had a conversation with fantasy fiction author John Crowley recently. I don't know if you know John's work, but if you don't, it's worth checking out if you're into the occult for sure. But he and I were talking about, or I asked him, do you think that authors choose their stories or that stories choose their authors? And I'm going to ask you the same thing because of your dream. Like, do you think maybe the muse was speaking to you through the dream? And and this is, you know, especially since you said you don't remember dreams usually, and this one was quite lucid. Do you think you channeled something or or something was trying to speak through you to to get this work out there? I do believe that. Um, I've had several people tell me that that for some reason, uh, it could be the idea that, you know, I had spent 20 years of researching and writing my first book, which was The Royal Arch of Enoch. When that came out, that was the, it originally came out in August 2012. And I quite literally, Ryan, um, when that came out, I immediately started in on cinema symbolism. And cinema symbolism, you know, when, when, when I had this dream, this would have been again in April of 13, you know, this would have probably been, you know, I would have been deep in the symbolism. And a couple of people told me 
people who are familiar with this sort of uh, phenomenon said, you know, because you were, you know, engaging in creative expression, you may have opened yourself up to a higher form of consciousness, streaming consciousness, a higher plane of reality. And I do believe that. I do believe for whatever reason I was meant to write this book. I do believe a lot of the characters and, and some of the stuff I analyzed factored into this. Like I said, with Highgate Cemetery, I mean, obviously I was there. Oxford University, I was there. Um, Honor Elizabeth Wainio um, from this bar that I used to hang in and hang out at. I mean, I, I do believe all that entered through my past experiences. But by and large, the story was original. The characters' names, the interaction, the mystery of the story. And and it was so lucid. I mean, it was just incredible. I mean, and I just remember being very impressed with it. And I liked it very much. And uh, I, I wrote it. And I, I, made, I remember when I woke up that morning, I made tons of notes about it. And, uh, you know, I started and I, I just really enjoyed doing it. And I believe that it was, you know, sort of meant to be. And I do believe it was a story that found me for whatever reason called a muse called channeling higher consciousness. But um, like I said, when I originally started, you know, set, set out to do this, I had never really planned on fiction. So you know, you, you never know what kind of you know, curveball or whatever fate has in store for you. But um, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I wrote it. I loved writing it. And I am enjoying writing the sequels and some of these backstories I'm currently working on. So, yes, I think in this case, the story found me. Um, not not sure quite why yet, but uh, maybe one day it'll become much more apparent to me. Definitely. Yeah. So let's transition now from your last book to your first book, which you just mentioned, The Royal Arch of Enoch, The Impact of Masonic Ritual Philosophy and Symbolism. Now, the Royal Arch of Enoch is what you call a, a high-degree Masonic ritual. What does the ritual encompass? Now, that may be a pun, actually. But what, what does the ritual encompass, and where does it come from? Right. The Royal Arch of Enoch was my first work, my first book. And you're, you mentioned earlier, it's not fiction, it's history. It's a historical book. The thesis of this book was that this particular high-degree ritual um, called the Royal Arch of Enoch, this is part of the high-degree systems, which in the United States primarily exists as the Scottish Rite and the York Rite. The, the, these rites were originally cultivated in something known as the Rite of Perfection, which came out of Paris, France in the 1740s, 1750s, that this high-degree ritual is incorporating components and elements of the lost Book of Enoch, the Ethiopian Enoch, which shouldn't be happening because uh, one Enoch or the Book of Enoch was lost to Western civilization from around 2nd, 3rd century till 1773 when it was restored to Europe by a man named James Bruce, who brought three copies back from Ethiopia. And then even at that point in 1773, he kept one of them. One was deposited in a library in France and the other one, the most famous one, was put in the Bodleian Library at Oxford University. I mean, and even at that point, it wasn't translated into English until 1821. So the, the Royal Arch of Enoch, the, the, the thesis of the book was to present this uh, never before discovered historical anomaly that this high degree ritual was incorporating um, and including components of the Book of Enoch. And why this is so important is it's one of the seminal, most important degrees in all of Freemasonry, arguably one of the most important rituals in the high degrees. And when, when I was researching and when I wrote the book, it really is the ritual, the symbolism coming out of it, the philosophies coming out of it, the, the ritual undercurrent coming out of it that was really being used to help craft and define the United States of America. And the symbolism coming out of it is just so important and so critical to understanding history and especially understanding Masonic history. So that was really the thesis of the um, first Masonic book. That came out originally in 2012. I republished it in 2016 in December. And yeah, that, that was my first book. And uh, like I said, it's, it's a heavy dose of history, of Masonic symbolism, of Masonic philosophy, and um, very intense books, people have told me. But again, that was my first book. And that was really the product, Brian, of this 20 years writing and research I had done into secret societies, the occult comparative religion, uh, comparative symbolism, ancient religions, uh, the mystery schools, things like that, that, that really uh, went into uh, crafting this book. So are you suggesting then that these rituals were being practiced before the Book of Enoch was known to even really exist in the Western world? Yes, that's, that's a good way of putting it. The, the ritual is not, is, is not how can I explain? It, it, it incorporates components of the Book of Enoch, and that, that, is, that is correct. That is what I'm saying is that someone out there, you know, when this ritual was being cultivated, and this gets into the whole backstory of the ritual, and you really have to know a lot of Masonic history here. Uh, I'll try to get into this as briefly as I can, but it's a very intense study. The Blue Lodge, as it exists today, this is Blue Lodge Freemasonry. This is degrees one, two, and three. This is the degrees of entered apprentice, fellow craft, master mason. 
these came together and were born in England, in London, specifically in 1717. Now, granted, this is when it first appears, quote unquote, on the history pages officially. Now, these degrees, these Masonic lodges, these craft guilds obviously existed before then um, in places like Scotland, England, the continent of Europe. I don't dispute that. But masonry proper as a, as, as a historical fraternal organization officially comes onto the setting, um, onto the history scene in 1717. As part of the counter-reformation, as crafted by the Society of Jesus in the 1740s and 1750s, these high-degree ceremonials are created as a counter-reformation ruse and ploy to subtly try to restore one of the Stuart pretenders, one of the Catholic Stuart pretenders, back to the crown of England. Like I said, it's a very deep study, but this high-degree ceremonial known as the Royal Arch of Enoch, and again, you have to understand and have a comprehension of what's going on in the Blue Lodge and what's going on in this high-degree ceremonial. Uh, briefly, in the Blue Lodge, the, 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 this character named Hiram Abiff, who's the architect on Solomon's Temple, has this secret word. Um, and this word is the name of God, which is known as the Tetragrammaton. And it's through this word, and specifically the correct pronunciation of this word, that all learning is made possible, the seven liberal arts and sciences and mathematics and geometry. Hiram Abiff is killed in the, in, in the third degree ritual, and the word is lost. You'll often hear, hear the term, the lost word of a master mason. This word that they're looking for is the secret name of God. Well, in the high degree ceremonial known as the Royal Arch of Enoch, the word, this name of God is found, found in a subterranean vault beneath the holy ground in Jerusalem. Uh, at any rate, this whole notion of the restoration of this word is a parallel politically of the restoration of these Catholic storts back to the throne of England. And it's a very deep stu study. It's all part of the counter-reformation. But yes, the, the crafters of this high degree ritual are incorporating elements of the Book of Enoch. And it's a great question to ask. I don't mind answering it. You know, is, is who could have had this copy or, or, or where could this copy have come from in Europe prior to Bruce bringing back copies? And, and I'm speculating here, but you, you have some possibilities here. One is a possible secret Vatican archive that could have had a copy or summary of this. And th there is there's evidence to suggest, and there's strong evidence to suggest, that the founder of the Jesuits, a man by the name of Ignatius of Loyola, one of the persons who influenced him substantially was a man named Guillaume Postel. And um, there's evidence to suggest that it, at some point in time after the Jesuits were founded, that Postel was visited by this mysterious Ethiopian uh, priest who came with him to Rome uh, and brought a copy of uh, the Book of Enoch, and that Postel saw it and made notes upon it, or maybe even had translated it, and that this was deposited in some sort of secret Vatican archive, and the Ethiopian priest returned to Ethiopia with, with the copy, but it was exposed to the Jesuits and to Postel specifically. Another character that could have had a copy, or at least a summary of it, that could have fallen into the hands of a secret order like the Jesuits was John Dee. And of course, D was Queen Elizabeth I's court astrologer, and, and D was involved with the spy with people like Sir Francis Walsingham, Jordana Bruno, Edward Kelly, Drake, people like that. Um, and D is a great candidate for this because one is um, he crafts a language to speak to angels and it's called Enochian. I mean, so where is he getting this from? Well, I mean, it's Enoch. It's the Book of Enoch. I mean, this is what happens with Enoch. This is what happens. In, you know, this is the whole summary of the Book of Enoch. He goes into the afterlife as conversations with angels and demons. So the mere fact that uh, he uh, named uh, his uh, language Enochian is, is, is evidence for this. But even better is uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, who was involved with aspiring with D to keep Queen Elizabeth of State from, uh, safe from radical Roman Catholics, the Jesuits. Sir Walter Raleigh uh, published a book called The History of the World. Um, and in this book, um, it, it's fascinating. Raleigh actually mentions the Book of Enoch and says in the Book of Enoch there was an astronomy astrology book, which there is. And, and, and it begs the question, well, well, how the hell does Sir Walter Raleigh know this? Where is Sir Walter Raleigh getting this information from? And the answer is obviously, uh, you know, his mis magical friend, Dr. John Dee, who must have had a copy of this thing. Um, I mean, that's not, not when, that can't be a so D is another likely source of, of a book of Enoch or summary of it um, that could have fallen, in, you know, it's, uh, could have fallen into the hands of the Jesuits after D's death. That I, I want to say around 1606, 1608 or so. Yeah, the, the thesis of the Royal Arch of Enoch book was that this high degree ritual was being crafted and is incorporating these elements of the book, some elements of the book of Enoch well before Bruce's return to Europe with copies in 1773. And then even then it wasn't even translated into English until 1821. That's the entire crux thesis of the Royal Arch of Enoch book. 
Yeah, I love me a good John D story as well. So the fact that he may be connected to it, which makes sense, you know, with the way that you pointed out there, his language was called Enochian. How the hell would he know about Enoch if that book wasn't around back then, right? Well, one would think. Um, I mean, you know, Enoch is mentioned in the Bible, and there were some Jewish legends about him. But it's John D had an extensive, exhaustive library on the occult and magic. Um, and to suggest that he didn't have, I mean, they could have had a copy of this thing. It's not far fetched or by any way. And, and, and what's really curious is that Ra mentions, I mean, probably in the history of the world, mentions that the Book of Enoch, the Ethiopian text, has a short book in it. I mean, how, how the hell does he know that? You know, where is he getting that from? I mean, the answer has to be he's getting it from his fellow spy, Dr. John D. And that seems likely to be. And then, uh, you know, what happened to the Book of Enoch if he died? Well, that's open to speculation. But certainly Dee's library was exhaustive, and to suggest it didn't find its way into Europe into a secret order like the Jesuits, that's not far-fetched in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, Dee, Dee's an interesting character, no doubt about it. And uh, like I said, his, his knowledge was deep and uh, dense. And um, for, for him to have a copy of the Book of Enoch, it's very possible, very plausible, no doubt about it. Definitely, yeah. So so anyone, Rob, who's turned on the History Channel in the last 20 years knows that our nation's capital, the District of Columbia, is ridden with Masonic symbolism. But how does the Royal Arch of Enoch play into this? Well, right. right. You're absolutely correct. Uh, Washington, D.C. is overloaded. Its architecture, its symbolism is overloaded with Masonic symbolism, not only you know, from the high degrees, but from Blue Lodge masonry, from masonry proper in general. Um, no question about it. You know, even the documents that founded this country, the Constitution, for example, the triple division of government between a chief executive, a legislator and a judiciary comes out of Blue Lodge Freemasonry, where the triple division of government is divided between the worshipful master and the two wardens. So we have that. Um, I mean, clearly you have a lot of solar symbolism going on, and the sun is probably one of the most, if not the most important uh, symbols, both in the Blue Lodge and turns up again in the high degrees. You have the Washington Monument, the object is a symbol of Amun-Ra, the Egyptian sun god, the Capitol building dome. The dome symbolism comes out of the world of Renaissance masters, Leon Battista and um, Andre Palladio, which is the dome, is the is the chamber of the sun god Apollo, which is a solar reference. Um, you have in Washington, D.C., the symbol of the 47th proposition of Euclid, which is the uh, Pythagorean theorem, which is A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Um, you'll find this embedded in the federal city right there in the heart of it between the White House, the Washington Monument, and then up the mall to the Capitol. And then the hypotenuse C squared would be Pennsylvania Avenue. And of course, if you're familiar with Freemasonry or, or, or Rosicrucianism, even um, this is a solar emblem as well with the one side representing Osiris, the sun god, and then uh, the other side representing his virgin consort wife, Isis, and then C squared, this would be the hypotenuse. Um, This would represent Horus, their perfected solar child. And of course, in in the federal district, you have, this would be Pennsylvania Avenue, which which connects the two elected branches of government, the chief executive and the legislator, the Senate and the House. Um, And this is, of course, Pennsylvania Avenue, and this is a royal arch symbol. Pennsylvania is, of course, the keystone in state, and a keystone is what creates an archway. You can't have an archway without a keystone. And the reason why Pennsylvania is the keystone state is that's where the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was formulated and signed. And what did, what did they do? Well, they took 13 separate blocks, separate architectural blocks, the states, and bound them into one, the United States of America. And that's exactly what a keystone does. It bounds all the blocks together, forming an archway. And then the archway is united by the keystone in the center. Um, that's why Pennsylvania is called the Keystone State. It unites 12 colonies into, or 12, 13 colonies into one United States, just as an archway's keystone unites 12 or 13 or 14 blocks into one archway. The, um, it's a symbol of perfection. The Royal Arch of Enoch ritual documents the recovery of the name of God. So it's, but, but by and large, it's, it's, it's a divine symbol. So you want your legislature and your chief executive to be imbued with this divine Masonic symbolism. That's why the two branches are united by Royal Arch Freemasonry or Pennsylvania Avenue. It's very adroit. It's very clever, very well hidden, hidden in plain sight, but a great example of a cult Freemasonry right there hidden in plain sight. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just, you know, skimming over some of this. I mean, you'll find this similar architecture in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, you'll find um, solar symbolism around uh, the the aerial template of Union College of Schenectady, New York, 
um, which was the first college to offer degrees, quote unquote, high degrees in civil engineering or operative masonry. You'll find a lot of the symbolism on the state seals and logos. The United States of America, I call it in the Royal Archivina book, a Masonic Republic, because everything in it is just imbued with Freemasonry from start to finish. What, what happened was people see it as evidence as a dark conspiracy. It was really never meant to be that way. It's, it's really the founders, um, when they were crafting this nation, they knew what they wanted and what they didn't want. They did not want a monarchy and they did not want a Vatican style organization. So what organization did a lot of these guys belong to that was, you know, preach democracy, egalitarianism, religious freedom? It was Freemasonry. I mean, the whole idea of separation of church and state comes out of Blue Lodge Freemasonry, where um, it's deism. Freemasonry doesn't em- embrace any specific religion. All it requires is a man to believe in a specific in a supreme being. Um, you can be Christian, you can be Jewish, you can be Muslim, you can be Hindu, you can be Buddhist. Uh, as long as you're not an atheist, as long as you believe in a supreme being, you can join Freemasonry. It, it does not endorse or support one specific religion of, over the other. And of course, that's the separation of church and state in the United States. So everything in the United States, I suggest in the Royal Arch of Enoch, and I think I present ample evidence of this, shows that the United States of America is what I call a Masonic Republic. You could probably even take that a step further, Ryan, and say it's a uh, Enochian Republic as well. That's something also that I would I would probably have no problem with. Yeah, definitely. And where do we see some Anakian symbolism at in other forms of government? I think you mentioned the Seal of California has some stuff in there. Right, right. I mean, you have the whole idea with the Seal of California. You have the word Eureka over it. That's a reference to Pythagoras um, when he goes into the Vault of Enoch. In the, in the Masonic ritual, the, the ritual involves the restoration or recovery of this Masonic treasure in a subterranean treasure vault beneath the Holy Ground. If you want to ever see this on, on the movie screen, watch the first National Treasure movie. In, in the ritual, and the underlying philosophy, the treasure vault is breached by two people previously to the Masons getting there. Um, one is a character coming out of Hellenistic Egypt known as Thoth Hermes Mercurius Trismegistus. He goes into the treasure vault, correctly pronounces the name of God, the Tetragrammaton, and restores the seven liberal arts and sciences back to mankind. The other person who goes down is the mathematician Pythagoras who discovers the Tetragrammaton, pronounces it correctly, and restores mathematics back to mankind. This is where he has his Eureka moment, right? Eureka, I have found it, meaning the name of God. So then we have the, also on the seal, we have the guy digging towards the subterranean vault. Exoterically, it's a miner. Esoterically, it's a guy uh, digging towards a hidden underground uh, subterranean treasure vault. This, This is confirmed the placement of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom on the seal. And again, Minerva is, you know, again, this symbolizes the restoration of wisdom and knowledge. And again, this is in keeping with the Royal Arch of Enoch mythology, which is the, co- the correct pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton and the restored restoration of this antediluvian knowledge placed there by Enoch, originally restored by Hermes, Trismegistus, and Pythagoras. Minerva turning up on the state seal of California is lifted from the Odd Fellow seal of two Odd Fellow lodges. In California, the Grand Lodge of California and the first Oddfellow Lodge, which I believe is called just Oddfellow Lodge Number One in California, which is a which is a replication of the which is a, well, it's a prototype of the state California steel. And Minerva is getting there by Leland Stanford, the founder of um, Stanford University on the San Francisco Peninsula. And 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 Minerva is finding her way there. She's she's originally coming in from Union College of Schenectady, New York where she is the emblem of the college. Again, she's a wisdom symbol. It's, she's, it, it's a symbol of knowledge, higher education. And the motto for Union College is the Masonically nuanced, we all are brothers under the laws of Minerva. So that's how Minerva, she's being transplanted there from the um, state seal, or excuse me, from the seal of Union College of Schenectady, New York, onto these two odd fellow seals um, in California. And then she finds her way there onto the state seal of California. The whole thing is Enochian. It has to do with um, the location of a subterranean treasure vault, we, you know, you know, Minerva, the restoration of wisdom. And of course, the word Eureka is a direct re- reference to Pythagoras and his um, recovery of the ma- you know, mathematical knowledge in the Enochian treasure vault there in the underlying Masonic mythology. Yeah, so you mentioned you'll see some of the symbolism in the film National Treasure. What are some other films that we will see some of this Enochian symbolism in? Well, National Treasure is the Masonic ritual on screen. If you ever see the movie uh, The Man Who Would Be King, that was based on a novella by Rudyard Kipling, who is also a Freemason. 
uh, and the two characters in it are Freemasons. Uh, this was a movie. This was, his novella was made into a movie in the mid '70s, starring Michael Caine and uh, Sean Connery, and and they're Freemasons in the movie. And Sean Connery actually becomes king of this of this uh, mysterious providence that has actually ties to gods and who look like extraterrestrials. They think he's a god when they actually see um, his Masonic emblem with the all-seeing eye in it. When they see that on, on, on Sean Connery, they make him a, a godlike king. And then shortly thereafter, the, there, there's, um, they, they take, uh, the, the, the natives take, you know, after, after they, they sort of install, install him as this Blue Lodge, quote unquote, worshipful master king of the country, then it kind of moves to the high degrees where, where Connery and Michael Caine are taken to a subterranean treasure vault. And shown all the secret treasure that this country has been hiding for all this year, all these years. Um, that that's a very adroitly hidden Sonaki Malakian reference in film. In the Royal Arch of Enoch, when I was writing it, um, I ended the last chapter talking about uh, how can I say Masonic solar Enochi and symbolism in film. The National Treasure movie was one that I talked about. The National Treasure two movie was another one. The, 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 the ritual, this Royal Arch of Enoch ceremonial, is the thirteenth degree in the Scottish Rite. It's the seventh degree in the York Rite. And you'll find this in movies sometimes where knowledge is needed, wisdom is needed. You'll find the number 13 popping up on screen. Uh, this is the case in the Da Vinci Code um, where they need wisdom, they need knowledge. The Mona Lisa was kept in Hall 13. Um, if you watch National Treasure 2, um, the information, the wisdom kept about the, the president's secret desk is in Chapter 13 of Riley's books. This is all Enochian Masonic symbolism um, regarding the, the restoration of wisdom, the restoration of knowledge. Whenever knowledge or wisdom is needed, you'll, if, if the filmmakers are sophisticated enough, you'll find the number 13 popping up on screen. Uh, but in the just just to wrap up in the Royal Arch of Enoch book, the last chapter dealt with uh, Masonic and Enochian themes, not only, you know, a national treasure, but like solar allegories such as the Arthurian legend being there, movies like that. So, you know, if you're interested in that, by all means, check out the Royal Arch of Enoch book. And then I wrote two movie books, which went well beyond that, you know, dealt with like ancient religions, mythology, mysticism, the occult, much more deeper study with, with the two movie books. But um, yeah, a lot of Masonic symbolism can be very prevalent in film, no question about it. Rob, what is next for you on your writing agenda? Because I know you've got a lot of stuff in the works. Is there anything you'd like to tell people that they can look forward to? Yeah, absolutely. Well, there are four books out right now, The Royal Arch of Enoch, Cinema Symbolism, Cinema Symbolism 2, and A Pact with the Devil, all of which we've covered very much. I'm currently working on five books at once right now. I'm working on Cinema Symbolism 3. I'm working on another book on Freemasonry, which is tentatively titled Freemasonry and the Path to Babylon. And I'm also working on a sequel to A Pact with the Devil. And I'm also working on some prequel stories to it as well to get into some of the backdrops of some of the characters of A Pact with the Devil. So I'm, I'm working on those four at once right now. I have also been commissioned to write another book. This is a history book. But unfortunately, Ryan, I am bound by a non-disclosure agreement currently on this book. So I can't go any further than that. This may be coming more and more to light in the coming months. We'll see. But right now, I can't unfortunately get into that. So I'm currently working on five books at once right now. I can't give you any timetables. When, when they may be released. But but if, if, if things go as uh, planned and things turn out the way I think they will, the, the commissioned book will be the first one released, which I will try to have out as soon as possible. So there are loads there for readers to pick and choose from. And they are all available right now in print form and ebook. Um, so by all means, check them out. Rob, where the hell do you find the time to do all this? Oh, it's there. I, I just work and uh, I love doing it. So it's, it's uh, a labor of love for me. And it's something that I'm really passionate about. And uh, I love doing it. And I, I love uh, watching movies and, you know, seeing this hidden symbolism that these guys hide in plain sight. So it's something I'm really passionate about. And it's something I really love. So it continues. And we are all glad it does. You are a valuable resource, like I said, up front here. So do tell people where they can find you and your work then. Yeah, absolutely. Again, thank you, Ryan, for having me on Occulture. Culture. It was a pleasure to be here. And if you're interested in my books, um, whichever one it may be, the easiest way to you know find me or the books is just go to my website. My, my name is Robert W. Sullivan IV. So my website is www. Robert W. Sullivan IV, the letter I, the letter V for the fourth dot com. Robert W. Sullivan IV dot com. Uh, links there to buy the books. You can get the print edition. You can get the ebook. They're available on all major online retailers such as Amazon, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble. Um, they are available overseas as well and all the major overseas online book sell sellers. Um, there are links uh, on the website to follow me on social media, links to my YouTube channel, information about podcasts I'm doing and podcasts that I'm going to be on, including this one. This one will eventually be there. Upcoming events and appearances like live radio show. There's my biography there. 
Very easy website to navigate. All the information you want is right there. And again, links to buy the books, uh, www.robertwsullivanivy.com. And thank you again, Ryan, for having me on the show. I thought it was terrific, and I look forward to a return appearance. Absolutely, man. You're welcome back anytime. And there you have it. My thanks again to Robert Sullivan the Fourth. You heard the man, Robert W. Sullivan, IV.com, if you're interested in picking up his books. If you missed the Patreon extension, we talked about John D., Alistair Crowley, Ian Fleming, and the alchemy of James Bond, the solar hero and solar journey in films like Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, and Harry Potter, alchemical symbolism and star lore in Harry Potter, more symbolism in The Wizard of Oz, a nice continuation from the last episode, the spaghetti westerns of Sergio Leone, which are some of my favorite films, Gangs in New York, Crimson Peak's connection to The Shining, which was pretty mind-blowing, the Communist Manifesto in the Smurfs, and Rob's discovery of what he calls occult casting, a fascinating look at how film may be cast to, well, I guess cast a spell over the narrative and invoke previous roles from actors and actresses. All in all, a nice reminder as well, as we head into the summer movie season, to keep your third eye open if you're trekking to the cinema anytime soon. Hey, we had a hell of a week on Patreon last week, so many shoutouts in order here. Carrie, Michaela, Natalie, Camillo, Tim, Adam, and Taylor. And also big thanks to Daniel and Caleb. Those two became official executive producers of the show. And you can too. Patreon is the best place to show some love if you like what you're hearing and want it to continue. Patreon.com slash oldculture is the love shack. And keep on dropping those reviews on iTunes or wherever you're listening as well. A few more came in on iTunes specifically. No names were left, but thanks to those of you who rated the show five stars. Much appreciated. And thanks to all of you who keep downloading. Let's keep this train rolling, man. In fact, I'm trying to keep this rolling. I'm trying to get another show out by the end of the month here. We'll see if I can. But that means I gotta get to it. So until next time... You've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.